When we read this gospel lesson in Bible study this week, the first comment was, wow, that's dark. <laughs> right? And, and this, is, this is kind of a dark text, right? It's, it's hard not to feel a little frightened and discouraged by it, right? Nations confused by the roaring of waves, people fainting from, flee, from fear and fleeing to escape calamity. The powers of heaven themselves, the sun and the moon and the stars being shaken. Maybe it's hard for you to hear any good news in this. Because, frankly, nothing Jesus talks about here sounds anything like the good news we're accustomed to, right? And yet, he says, now when these things begin to take place, stand up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. That's all we have to hang our hat on in these bleak, dark images, this vague assurance that somehow it heralds the coming of our redemption. If Advent is the season of hopeful anticipation leading up to Christmas, this may not seem like a very good Advent text at first, but I think it speaks directly to our experience of Advent. Advent is the darkest time of the year. Throughout the season, we direct our focus on the light which is coming, but as we wait for that light, we are in definition waiting for what is not yet here. So Advent is a season of experiencing the darkness rather than the light. Literally, as well as symbolically, right? The days are as short now as they ever will be. We spend Advent reflecting on the absence of God rather than on God's presence. Advent proclaims that this darkness itself is holy. The darkness is holy because it points us to God. Not by its destruction or defeat, but that the darkness itself is a sign of God's presence. That might be a little hard for us to wrap our heads around because darkness makes us so uncomfortable. Look at how we even use the language. Dark means bad, frightening, depressing. God is light. God is brightness. Dark is the antithesis of God. That may be what makes this text so hard to access because God is revealed in the darkness in this text, in the bad and frightening things rather than in the good and pleasant things. But we know that darkness isn't inherently bad, right? Darkness is necessary. It's good, even. We need darkness in order to sleep. Dark colors contrast bright ones and give beauty to art and nature. Perhaps the darkness of this story can provide us an alternative way of understanding darkness itself. A fresh perspective that will allow us to see good news in it even when it looks bleak and terrifying otherwise. It's like how on a bright day, a really bright sunny day, you can walk into a dark room with the curtains drawn, and at first you can't see anything, right? But as you wait and let your eyes grow accustomed to the dark, soon you can make out shapes and figures and maybe even be able to read. The temptation in our culture is always to avoid and ignore and defeat what is dark, to drive it away. But by sitting in the darkness, we may be able to begin to see things that we wouldn't otherwise. For example, as I come to this text, my first experience of it, perhaps like many of you, is discomfort and fear. This is a frightening text. The dissolution of everything I know sounds very unpleasant. If God is life and creation, then destruction sounds fundamentally evil rather than good. This text is dark, because just like that dark room, I can't see God in it. But as I sit in the darkness of the text, I become aware of something else. In this case, I become aware of the fact that I am reading this text as a white person. As a white person living in the time and place that I do, I have an immense amount of privilege. And because of that, yes, I'm frightened to hear about the kinds of things Jesus talks about in these verses because he's talking about the passing away and the ending 
of systems that give me that privilege, those systems that benefit me. A person who lacks the privilege that I have may hear something else in this story. Such a person might respond to Jesus' predictions of calamity and disorder with hope because those same systems that benefit me oppress them. They may be waiting with hopeful anticipation for the end of those same systems that I fear to lose. As it happens, in our country, many of the people who read this story in that way have skin that is dark. And that often causes people who look like me to see those people as frightening or even bad. Isn't that interesting? How my bias against darkness and even the whiteness of my skin can blind me to the presence of God in other people and in this story. Can close me off to an entire way of seeing hope in this text. How my experience as a person of privilege can keep me from seeing the hope that Jesus explicitly tells us is in this vision. What if there are other things, other ways of experiencing God even, that might keep us from seeing the whole picture, just like the bright light of that summer's day can keep us from seeing the furniture in a dark room? Maybe that's why it's so important for us to have this time of Advent and darkness. Maybe we need darkness. Not just to better help us help us better appreciate or perceive the light, but actually to experience what it is impossible to experience in the light. In order for that to happen, though, we have to be willing to sit in the discomfort and the uncertainty of Advent for a while. To trust that God is in the darkness, transforming us through that darkness. And so darkness then can not only be necessary, but even healthy and holy, as it helps us to enter into a deeper relationship with God. St. John of the Cross recognized that those feelings of satisfaction or fullness or whatever that we experience uh, as God's presence can actually blind us to God. Because those feelings, those things that make us, those feelings and the things that make us experience them, things like uh, prayer or blessing, and even the minds with which we experience them, all those things are finite. Right? God is infinite. Which means, as John re recognized, that God fundamentally cannot be ado uh, adequately contained within those finite experiences. In order to know God more fully, we must come to know God in the absence of all of those consolations, as he calls them. He calls that process of learning to see in the dark, the dark night of the soul. We've come to associate the dark night with angst or suffering, and oftentimes that's what accompanies it, but it's simply the inability to see God in the places we're used to finding God. Things like spiritual practice or pleasure or religious experience. But most interesting, John writes of the dark night of the soul as a blessing, as a gift from God, who invites us in that darkness into knowing God more fully, beyond simply seeing God in the quote-unquote good things of life. Because if we only ever experience God in the pleasures and joys, then those pleasures and joys risk becoming our gods. We risk seeking only our own comfort, our own privilege. We reduce the cosmic redemption of Christ to simply some fiddly prosperity gospel, and we lose sight of God entirely. But we know from Christ that God is present in the darkness, even when we can't see God. Not just from this text, but from the whole life of Christ. Christ is fundamentally about God revealed in death and suffering. 
that is the person who is telling us to raise our heads and to stand up because our redemption is drawing nigh. That's what John means by calling it a dark night. Simply that God is present in a way that we can't see because we can't see in the dark. And so knowing that God is present, if not seen, Jesus then encourages us to be on guard, to be alert to God's presence in the darkness. In our on-demand culture of instant gratification and convenience, this darkness, this time of waiting and sitting in the absence is the gift of Advent. If we are ready to sit in the tension without attempting to resolve it or release it, perhaps that tension might work on us. Perhaps the Holy Spirit might teach us in that tension something new about God and about ourselves. We might come to know God more fully. That's why this Advent season, our midweek worship services will focus on appreciating the darkness. We will explore how darkness is not only natural and necessary and good to our understanding of God and ourselves, but also just beautiful in its own right. Our culture is so preoccupied with action and presence and substance, and those are good things. But we also need to take some time intentionally to make space to seek God in the waiting, in the absence, in the emptiness of Advent. Jeremiah was able to see God in the darkness of exile. And he testified to the promise of renewal that was inconceivable in that moment, something nobody could see. And although his vision of a righteous branch of David was never realized in the way that he imagined, with the restoration of a sovereign nation of Israel under a Davidic king, his vision made room for people generations later to see God doing something great in Jesus. Paul writes with such effusive glee and thankfulness to the Thessalonians because when he arrived in the city, he wasn't there for very long before he was driven out. He didn't have a chance to finish organizing that congregation of Christians. And so that's a story you can read in Acts chapter 17 if you like. But when he left, he was convinced that that nascent church there would fall apart when he left. So imagine his surprise and his joy when he learned that they not only endured his absence, but also became known for their steadfastness and faith and their loving, uh, the love with which they shared the gospel. He writes to them today with longing and anticipation to return to them, a longing which he sees mirrored in Christ's longing to return to us. The story of Christian faith is a story of darkness. It is the story not only of light shining dimly in the shadow, but of God working in the shadow itself to bring about something new. When God says this, excuse me, when Jesus says this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place, he's telling the truth. Those first Christians did see the Son of Man return, perhaps not coming in the clouds with glory, but cloaked in shadow. They saw the miracle of Jesus of the cross played out again and again. They experienced resurrection. And so I wonder if the good news in this dark story is that it remains just as true for us and for our generation as it did for theirs and for every generation that has come since and every generation that will come after. If God is in the darkness, unseen and unfelt, then when things seem the most dark, isn't there a good reason for us to stand up and raise our heads and know that our redemption is near? But first, we have to be taught to recognize God in the darkness. And so I wonder, where is the dark most prevalent in your life? Where does God seem most absent or impotent to you?
Is there a way for you to safely sit in that darkness? To encounter it without turning away and to learn from it? Maybe there isn't. But if there is, maybe there's something to be discovered by embracing that darkness. I wonder what you might learn by being alert in that darkness. I wonder if you might even stand before the Son of Man. <laughs>